right, good morning, everybody. Holy smokes, there's a whole bunch of people. <laughs> this is great. All right, so let me just get this up here. Okay, so welcome to my talk, Rethink, Repurpose, Reuse, Rain Hell. Um, I, have to, I feel like I have to put a legal disclaimer up, and I'm sorry, it's because some of the things that you can do with this type of technology could be used for bad, but that's up to you. And it's also it's your responsibility to educate yourself and others about how you can use this type of stuff to protect yourself, to see what other people can get away with and what they're going to do to you, so you know what angles they can come at you. Um, it's, I, I, I will not be held responsible for anything bad you do or any devices that you break, which may happen as a, as a result of this. So, um, <laughs> a while ago, one of the closest people to me uh, dragged me down to Las Vegas and uh, they got me to, oh, sorry, thanks. Uh, they got me to go to my first DEF CON and uh, I was blown away. Uh, there were so many different fields down there that I didn't realize uh, how advanced things had gotten. Um, there's categories like cryptography, uh, hardware hacking, wireless hacking, lockpick, and everything felt like it was its own type of trade. It was like, where do you start? It seemed like Backtrack, that type of Linux, Linux distribution, had all kinds of tools on it already for you to use. Um, so it, something else caught my eye in the market area where it was called the Pwn Phone. And Pony Express was a company that came out with this uh, maybe back in 2011. And it almost had all these types of tools and the functionality that you'd get out of your desktop computer, but in this itty-bitty device. And I'll get more to that later, but it's uh, running on an N, uh, Nokia N900. And that came out in 2009, and it's still half decent. <laughs> so um, to put it simply, um, ideally, we'd like to get any Linux distribution running on as many devices, newer legacy, that we can. So maybe an old device that you have lying around, an old Android, that can now be a sensor or a mini web server or even something to just broadcast MP3s throughout your house. How can I unlock it to, to get this functionality that I should have had with my hardware to begin with? Well, to make it a little more interesting, how to get Kali and other programs associated with that running on everything we can, you know, like a microwave. Um, so it's a different age right now. Um, Market competition in mobile computing is really exploding, right? They're pushing out new models so fast. Uh, the old ones aren't really obsolete by the time the next one comes out. So what do we do with all these old models? Um, there's, uh, there's a lot of chipsets to consider. There are pros and cons when working with them, but sometimes you work with what you got. Um, something else to consider is Intel starting to pick up and gain momentum. Um, some devices have Atom processors that can run other operating systems, but how can we get that far? Um, there are many out there that seem to be affordable to start experimenting with, and uh, ideally that's where we'd like to get with where I can run one any, any Linux distribution on any x86 device that I buy instead of having to be forced to use their OS. Um, a lot of this comes from community work because, I mean, all the ideas are open source exchange. If somebody kept this to themselves, you'd never be able to put it together. So a lot of it's piece, piecemeal work, and it's taking somebody's good idea and just repurposing it for your own. Um, Okay, so uh, research is, is key here. Um, you can spend all day trying to look for something, and you know, you'll never find it if you're looking in the wrong part of the internet. Sometimes it's, it's a very complex forum post that runs on and has many people contributing to it, something for like a Galaxy or a really popular device. Um, and you know it's vetted, it's, it's a lot of people have come back with feedback on it and you understand what you can use here. Um, or maybe it's just a single post on a form that's not even in your language. But you use Google Translate, you look through it, and all of a sudden this has a piece of firmware or a little patch or something that you can use. Um, and sometimes the only way of understanding of what it's going to do is to run that in a controlled environment. Hopefully it's small enough that you could look through the code. Maybe if it's like a shell script, you can actually take a look at it and you know have an idea of what it's doing. Uh, otherwise, it's up to you to take that risk and go either way. But that's the fun with experimenting with random code. Um, I'm going to have a blog. I'll put the contact stuff at the end of the slide. Uh, I'm not a big blogger anyways, but I wanted somewhere to, to organize all my thoughts for this type of thing. So when I slowly get you know, different files or how to, to do um, certain devices, I'll throw any of my information up there. Ideally, I'd like to brainstorm with anyone. Uh, just email me, if, and my information will be at the end, and we can talk about any type of device that you have. Uh, I'd be glad to sit down and try and figure it out. It's like a crossword puzzle for me. Okay, so things to consider before starting. Um, you can do almost anything to your device if you can back up and recover it. Um, it'll save you lots of stress, time, and money, um, but it'd be kind of painstaking to do so, uh, depending on what you're working with. Um, if you have some of the types of developer devices, sometimes factory images are available to you, and that makes it so much easier. 
Otherwise, if you can make a backup yourself, that's also a bonus. Um, sometimes that involves installing a custom recovery. Ideally, it'd be better if you didn't have to modify the system and you can do a, you know, like a DD type of copy and just go bit for bit, but it doesn't work that way right now. If anybody's got any good ideas about that, I'd be glad to hear them. Um, for now, it still seems the best way to get a recovery is to either have a factory image available or um, do it yourself if you can do like an Android backup on Android devices. Um, for an x86, you know, it'd be easy enough to just be able to use live boot and you can throw on the original operating system again. But we need to get that far. Hopefully, the BIOS will let us through. All right. So, uh, N900. Um, so this thing did come out a while ago, but it's still pretty useful. Uh, one of the interesting things on it, it still has 32 gigs of storage, which at the time was probably a lot, and a little FM transmitter that you can't really use. Um, the best thing, though, is it's got injection drivers built right into it. So as far as wireless stuff goes, you don't need a really fast processor to start wrecking havoc. So even this little thing with its tiny processor, just the fact that it's got those injection drivers hidden in it could play all kinds of damage on somebody's network without them knowing, and good luck trying to pinpoint it. Um, and that was where the inspiration that I got to, to start looking into other devices. How can I carry this so that any other device that I have can do, have that same type of functionality? So the nicest thing of, with this is those um, onboard injection drivers. And after looking at other devices, I found how much of a treat that was. Um, you find not everywhere, but we'll get into what we can do about that and workarounds. Um, so root of the day, it's Android. It's I guess it's the change root command. I always pronounce it wrong. I say crude or shroot, but it's the change root command. And essentially, it's or it's what we're going to do to get Linux working in places that we can't. Um, there's a whole bunch of automated ways to do it right now. Um, ideally, you can do it by yourself. Um, Debian has a great walkthrough online. It's a little complicated, but I think it's great. Um, depending on your hardware, you can give it a shot. Otherwise, if it's your first time, try maybe an automated install just to see, let it figure out everything for you, and then you can go back and figure out how it works. Um, and kernels make a big difference, especially on Android devices with USB host. Um, some of the Nexus lineups, after the fact, they added kernel support for uh, on-the-go charging with a Y cable or allowing you to connect to like an external Wi-Fi dongle. Um, some of the things, if you want to do Wi-Fi attacks with Kali Linux and you can't ex uh, uh, attach an external Wi-Fi card, well, what really good is that for? You can do stuff on the same network, but aside from that. So uh, that can make you pull your hair out. Sometimes there's little things you can do um, to, to, to get that functionality, though, um, and we'll get to that. Just wanted to mention a, a, a quick, I guess, what way I'm going to put it, if, you're, if you have no other options, kind of like a last-ditch effort, you can use something called new root. And it's not really Linux. It creates its own kind of little, I want to say subsystem that it doesn't work the same. I'm, I'm explaining that bad. But it'll give you console access to a few types of busy box type of programs without you having to root your device or do anything. So you could get creative with there if there's a certain command you needed. So the install options. So manually, you can go through the Debian walkthrough. Um, it's on their Debian wiki. I'll also have that on my webpage later if anybody's interested. Um, they used like a, an old Vodafone, actually. I think it was um, an HTC. So you can get away with anything almost as long as you can get that root access. Um, it could be challenging, but it's a good time learning. <coughs> Otherwise, I recommend Linux Deploy. Um, if anybody's heard of that, it's a decent uh, app. You need root access on your device and a good amount of storage, but essentially it creates a whole file system for you. So. That's, I'm sorry, that's a horrible screenshot. <laughs> but that's the install process for Linux Deploy. And when you're done, you're left with a result like, let's see if this thing will just turn on here. You can get full Kali Linux kind of running straight on the tablet. So the problem, like I was saying with this one, this was kind of like a salvage. It was an old LG G pad with 3D cameras on the back. And a buddy brought it to me because he didn't know what else we can do with it. Maybe we can you know, learn with it. Problem is, it does have a micro USB port, but it doesn't support on the go. And there wasn't much development done for this tablet, so without reinventing the wheel, it's not really going to get USB on the, host, on the go support um, without some really nifty, uh, something that I haven't figured out yet anyways. But otherwise, you can still uh, sign onto the same network and um, test to see if like art poisoning is working properly or other man-in-the-middle attacks. Those things will still work properly for you. Um, but that's just one example. So NetHunter is... Um, Kali's version of Android change root command, but they automatically install it. It's for Nexus devices. Um, through Windows, they have an automated installer that completely wipes your device for you and um, throws on... Sorry, guys. 
it, it completely wipes your device for you and throws uh, NetHunter on um, without you having to do much. So you can just get right to playing with it. Let's try this again, sorry. Okay, sorry about that. So, the Nexus devices are my favorite for NetHunter. Um, they're pretty simple to set up and after the fact, they even have a nice touchscreen menu for you to start kind of using the, to turn on some of the services that you would usually have to type longer commands in so you can get right to them. And then after that, if you really have to drill down, there's a modified keyboard or if you wanted, you can add like a Bluetooth keyboard on the side to um, type in the rest of your commands. Ideally, the coolest thing about it though is if you have something like a Nexus 4 or the newer Nexus devices that support SIM port, you can essentially just turn that straight into like almost a desktop PC. It's not as powerful, but you're running all your Kali Linux commands. You can add a little USB uh, 3 port port on there. And the port, something similar to like a micro USB hub with a couple of dongles on it, could give you, you know, your, uh, your wireless adapter, um, external storage if you wanted to do password cracking attacks, Bluetooth adapter, whatever you want to get creative with, or keyboard and mouse even. Sorry, I don't know why this keeps doing that, I apologize. So. Um, there are, now there's also, say you can't get anywhere with your device and you do just want a few pen testing apps on there to play around with. Um, there's one called Xanti by Symbarium. Now it used to be called Desploit if anybody else had ever used that. And it was almost like a man in the middle toolkit for anybody on Android. If your device was rooted, you threw this on and it was a script kitty's dream. It had all kinds of ways for you to in do injection attacks, rickroll people, all kinds of little childish things. But the fact was you could quickly, you know, audit the network to see if you can do these attacks easily. Um, so Xanti came out, it's a little more professional actually, it's not bad at all. Uh, it does require an account, but I think they update it a lot more often so there's newer attacks that you can get away with. Um, I believe you can even do like the pixie dust attack if you have an on-the-go on dongle straight from their program instead. Um, BCMon, now this was a project I saw at Recon, I think it was 2012 or 2013, and that treat I was talking about uh, with the N900s actually having injection drivers built in, these guys created one for Broadcom 4329 chipset devices. So that's the Nexus 7 2012, older devices, the Galaxy S2. But essentially, those could be the next N900s where they have injection drivers built into them, and then you don't need to connect all these other devices to run complicated wireless attacks. Um, the other things on there, though, were, were the reason why I put that uh, sad smiley face, all, all people tried coming out with different GUIs like Reaver, um, <coughs> I believe there was Reaver, there was a couple Aircrack ones as well, but they didn't work properly and you couldn't get around the GUI, so it, it was kind of like nightmare. Um, it was a lot better to just execute it yourself, so that's why we wanted to go straight to the source. That's an example of an old $40 tablet that I had, but it just has some of those apps on there. You can see Desploit and there's like Wi-Fi kill to knock people off. Really simple as um, script kitty type ones, so nothing crazy. Uh, and I always had a dream <laughs> of all these Android boxes that they're selling out there. As soon as I get it, taking Android or Windows off and just putting Linux straight on there. So a while ago, there was a Rockchip 3066 device, and Kali did have support for it originally, where you just loaded an SD card and booted from, um, instead of into that dongles, Android or Windows, you went straight into to Linux. So again, with a, with a nice hub, you could have all the other devices that you wanted and have a little computer anywhere you needed. Um, okay, so what I was getting to then was Instead of playing around with Android and all these other devices and having an intermediate, why can't we go straight to the source? And I don't want to do any translating or emulating. I want to actually run the program natively. Um, so I found this HP Stream 7 tablet. Um, I felt like they were a lost leader. Around last year, Microsoft started selling them for 100 bucks. It was a $100, uh, sorry, $25 gift card to go with them. Um, and uh, they, were, they were cheap, but I, didn't, I, I couldn't believe how, how well it ran Windows. Um, so it has a, it's an Intel Atom 3735G, and now you'll see these in a lot of tablets now coming out. There's a lot of, of weird brand tablets that also have them. But it has an HP bootloader, kind of similar to your laptop. When you go in there, it asks you for what boot device you want to go to, do you want to go to BIOS options, kind of stuff that I'm used to finally, none of this Android recovery that I had to relearn from originally I was used to Windows, or not Windows, but desktop PCs anyways. Um, and I couldn't believe it ran Windows smooth. So that's what they wanted, that's what I wanted. So instead we got Kali Linux on there on with the Windows logo. Um, so here's a little demo video. It's, uh, sorry, it's a little choppy. But, so that's it running the uh, original, I think it's 1.10 version of Kali. And that was somewhat fun to start. 
still got all access to, to most of your apps, and the on-to-go port worked great, so you could just install a uh, Wi-Fi dongle, and it was, it was awesome. So if you needed a couple, uh, you could <laughs> get really creative. But then I saw the new version of Kali, and the first thing I saw was the lock screen. I went, hey, I can swipe up. And there's an on-screen keyboard now. Oh. So the worst part is getting the touchscreen drivers to work off the bat. They're not really with the kernel. Somewhere um, on Ubuntu forums, um, someone wanted to install Ubuntu on this tablet. OK, so I wanted to work from there. He already brought it so, so much further uh, down the path for us. Um, pretty well, the hardest part was 32-bit uh, UEFI. So I guess all the Linux distributions, or majority of them right now, don't ship with a 32-bit UEFI. It's all 64-bit. So if you try and live boot, it doesn't know what to do. It just looks at it like this media kit has got nothing to boot from, and it goes on to trying to load the rest of your system. Um, somebody came out with a project uh, where they were trying to convert Fedora to running on these types of tablets. So they created a boot file. It was simple enough that somebody else repurposed that for Ubuntu, and then we repurpose it for Kali or whatever other distro that you want. So just by simply using that boot file, which I have available here, and I'll try and throw online, and there's links to, to credit the people who did create it. Um, you can throw it on any one of your devices, and uh, all of these Bay Trail or Intel tablets moving forward can run um, your full desktop version of Linux without any modifications. So this was just going in. Some of the hurdles you'll run into is like secure boot. It's just at first you have to disable it so you can modify anything, but that's not a big deal. Um, okay, yeah, sorry. So I did mention that it'll work on, on pretty well any tablets. So if you're running like an old version of Linux, you'll run into random errors that <laughs> You it was like needle in a haystack. One of them was an MMC error, and it, for some reason, the Linux kernel prior to four did not like um, the type of SSD controller on this card. Uh, sorry, on on this on this tablet. So um, essentially, at first, you had to let the thing run for such a long time. Um, it took almost. 300, 320 seconds to actually boot into Linux, which was, oh, which is not acceptable. Um, sorry about that. Just one sec here. So I got lucky. I was trying to look for a way to, to actually patch the kernel before um, I could do anything, because if not, as soon as you boot into it, it would just scroll and scroll and scroll. But we got lucky with Kali Linux 2.0 where that patch is already actually in the kernel. But just something to consider where all kinds of devices are gonna have little niche problems that might not work the way you expect to, so be prepared for that. But some of the fun is finding one that doesn't have those problems. So after you've experimented and, oh, oh my god, it actually works the way I wanted it to, which is extremely lucky. <laughs> so uh, I'm moving forward. I'd like to build a, a custom, uh, I guess, kernel and uh, ISO package that's already got everything you need so it's lean, it just runs straight on 32 bits, so moving forward, those will be the types of releases that will come out and you don't have to do any other finagling. It'll just work on these devices. Um, there's, there's so many of them coming out and they're so inexpensive. Uh, a lot of them are generic and uh, I hate to say most of them come from the other side of the world in China, but in, in they're weird knockoffs. Um, but they have these random innovations, like you'll find a little $40 tablet that has HDMI out on it, just natively. All of a sudden you can connect this to a different monitor and just use that as, as basic touch control. This thing is a monster that I found on the internet. I don't really know what it is, but it seems to be like an Android <laughs> box and a tablet. And I don't know what they were thinking when they made this, but I want it. It's cool. It's different. You know, I just, I don't know if I'll pay a hundred bucks for it. Maybe, okay, I will. It's cool. <laughs> but, um... You know, they're going to come up with all kinds of things. And at least if we know moving forward that it doesn't matter what it looks like, that it's got these kind of specifications to it, then I'm going to start playing with it. I'm going to put Kali on there. Um, sometimes it goes wrong, though. And I was talking about when you have a recovery, you can do anything because you can play around with it and just reset it back. I, I found this $25 clearance tablet at Walmart, which was, even for the price is great. Just use a remote control. Um, the specifications are on there. It's nothing too crazy. But there's no backup methods that I can figure. Nobody cares to develop for the tablet, so there's no custom recoveries or anything. And I emailed the company to see if I can get factory reset images, and they told me I could spend $60 and send it in and get it fixed, which would be worth more than two of the tablets that I bought. So not happening. Um, 
So actually, at least though I have two, I have two extras, and I'm trying to find a way where I can actually rip the firmware from there and then restore this one and then move forward, use that everywhere. This is what I'm stuck with now. I think I destroyed the cache on it. But if anybody has any ideas, I'd like to talk about it. <laughs> and that's it. Thank you guys so much for today. Uh, I really appreciate it. Does, does anybody have any questions, or do I have time for questions? That's a good question. You know, it does get uh, pretty bad, actually. It does start sucking it out. And that's one of the things you can do when you do have the dongles. I've been looking for a proper one that'll allow you to charge while you, so you can charge the devices on the dongle, charge your uh, device, and use a battery backup, right? Like have a, you know, 3,000 mil, um, milliamp hour one to, to charge everything. I haven't found a good one yet. <laughs> the one I'm bringing here, it was supposed to do that. Right, right. Yeah, it'll start dying a lot quicker on you, right? Yeah, I found even with, well, especially with the Wi-Fi uh, connected on there, yeah, you can almost watch the battery go down. Uh, but um, yeah, I think with the battery backup, if we get the right like USB 4 port hub, that will allow you to do that. I found a tiny one, um, and hopefully I can get that one working where it even has SD card support just in the hub. If I do, I'll throw it online, definitely something to take out. Anybody else? You know what? That's a good question. No, actually, I do feel like they do heat up a little bit more. So yeah, it's something to watch. So, you know, it's not—they're not ideal, and I feel like there has to be a lot more work to get these things to, to where we want them to be. But if we all start doing that, maybe they won't be so inefficient. <laughs> Injection drivers, so pretty well they turn your wireless card into what we have as regular mode. I think it's uh, monitor. No, it's not monitor mode. Promiscuous. Pr promiscuous mode, yeah, and that's just you looking around at, at normal wireless networks to the way we function and connect to them. Then it turns it into monitor mode with the ability to inject packets into other uh, Wi-Fi connections. So this way, you kind of antagonize the connection and you play with the packets in the air and put your own and force something that shouldn't be there. Um, there's a lot of different methods depending on the type of wireless that you're dealing with, though. Uh, anyone else? Uh, any play with the uh, first gen iPads? Uh, the best I've seen, and uh, you know, I did want to make a big, uh, quick uh, mention about it, but I didn't get to play too much. After you jailbreak it and install Cydia, um, there's a couple of port scanning tools you can get pretty easily. I think Nmap works for it. Um, I haven't seen, um, I wanted to look, but I didn't have enough time to research for on-the-go support if you did get a proper dongle. Um, I know there's a little bit of development being done, but there's a lot of hurdles, so it's a little bit harder to get it going. Um, but definitely on Debian, I think it was. Uh, you know what, if you want, send me an email later, and I'll send you the link for the, the one on, on Debian, or on, on Cydia, sorry. Actually, you know what? Just this morning, someone was talking to me about something similar to that, and I hadn't, I hadn't thought about it. Um, All right, we're going to talk later, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, is that everyone? All right. Thank you guys very much. I appreciate it. <laughs> okay. All right. So you still have a job to do. You get to pick which one of the questions you think is worthy of a $50 voucher. Uh, All right. Well, that's going to have to go to Mr. Hypervisor. There you go. <laughs> All right. Thanks a lot, guys. Appreciate it. Okay.